We want to start right here with big changes to a program millions of Canadians need because they lost their jobs. The CERB was due to run out this month. That has now been extended to September 27th. After that, the plan is for people still on CERB to transition to EI, which the government is easing the qualifications for. Now, if you don't normally qualify for EI because, for example, you're a gig worker, you can apply for the Canada Recovery Benefit, which will provide $400 a week. Two other benefits were also announced today. One, if you're sick yourself, or one, if you have to care for someone else who is. Altogether, the total bill for these changes, $37 billion. But with Parliament prorogued and a confidence vote awaiting the government in September, are these programs really a done deal? Carla Qualtro is the Minister of Employment, and she joins us from the foyer of the House of Commons. Hi, Minister Qualtro. Good to see you, as always. Hey. Uh, Minister, I want to start off on that question of, of prorogation and, and specifically for the, you know, the number of Canadians, I think it's a million by your own estimates today, who are on the CERB but won't be able to qualify for EI. That new benefit that you're creating, it needs legislation to get up and running, but Parliament is shut right down right now. Is that fair to those Canadians? Well, I have absolute confidence that, like with the CERB and with the student benefit, we're going to be able to work with opposition parties and get legislation through to create these benefits. I'm honestly not worried about it at all. The other parties recognize this as a crisis, and they want to work to make sure Canadians are supported through it. But it's really not that simple, Minister, right? If, if you want to work with opposition, I'm, I'm sure they're willing, you know, they want to work on this too. I take your point that everyone understands how important this is. Before you can work together on it, though, there's going to be a throne speech. That's what yeah. the Prime Minister announced two days ago. So in order for you to get to the point where that happens, the throne speech will face a vote of confidence. The Prime Minister also explicitly said that, and that vote will have to pass, right? So you're, you're yes. essentially predicating help for these Canadians on that happening. Absolutely, and we know that when Canadians and opposition parties hear our vision for Canada moving forward in this new world, this new reality, this new Canada, kind of living with COVID, um, this is going to be a central part of it. This is a key component. This how we're going to support Canadian workers over the next year, potentially beyond, is going to be a key aspect of that vision. But, but respectfully, that doesn't answer whether or not other stuff isn't part of that, right? Isn't something that they're willing to support. You're, you're basically saying to opposition parties, if you want to be a part of helping Canadians, you have to agree to the rest of the stuff we're putting forward. And in the meantime, those Canadians won't be receiving that help. Well, and, you know, there, the extra four weeks of CERB to get people to the end of September. And remember, CERB has always been available to people until the end of September. It's just a significant number of Canadians were running out of their entitlement at the end of August. So basically, we wanted to bridge the gap between when most people are running out and when the program actually ends, which is technically October 3rd, and then transition to EI and transition to a new set of recovery benefits at the same time. But, but September 23rd is when Parliament comes back. Again, you've given yourself, and this is by design, right? I, I could take, I understand the point if, for example, someone else has shut down Parliament, but, but your government did it to themselves, right? So you've given yourself four days to do everything that you just talked about. Uh, well, it's not actually four days. Technically, we won't have to start paying Canadians these new benefits till mid-October because the way we pay EI and the way we'll be paying these new benefits will be in arrears. But I completely get your point. Um, but what I can tell you is I think when the opposition digs into the elements of these new benefits, they'll see a lot that they were asking for. We've really been listening, things they didn't like about the CERB. I think we've addressed. Happy to hear what they have to say about these benefits and happy to find other ways to deliver them if we can't do it through legislation. What, what might that be? What would other ways be to do it? You know, there's, 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 there's options available to us through regulation, but perhaps through my own departmental legislation. Not ideal, not what we want. We want to put this on the floor of the House of Commons. Our emergency authorities, financial authorities, also expire at the end of September. So there's a lot of government uh, emergency measures that have to be put on the table for funding, you know, by the end of September. And the opposition knows that. And it was always the plan to work with them in September to figure out how we were going to move forward. This is just another aspect of that in my my opinion. Doesn't what you just outlined provide more reasoning to actually be working right now, to actually be in par and working in Parliament, I should qualify. I know a lot of work's being done outside right. of Thank Parliament, you. but, but <laughs> should, you know, do doesn't that what you just said, the fact that all that stuff you're coming up against at the end of September, uh, you know, uh, sort of underscore why the opposition says, actually, we should be working over the next few weeks. Even if you have to prorogue for a bit for a recess, yeah. fine, do it for a week, but five weeks? I completely see your point. Um, and what I can say is part of the reason we, were, we laid out this plan today and we are going to work with opposition, my critics in particular, over the next weeks is to get everybody on the same page so that it's almost a fait accompli by the end when we have to introduce this at the first possible opportunity after Parliament comes back. 
again, though, isn't that the, the, the idea of it being a fait accompli? I mean, that's assuming a lot of the opposition, right? That's assuming they're okay with, with what you've decided. Are, are you willing to, for example, if they do come up with some changes, if they'd like to see different things, are you willing to amend what you've proposed today? We are always, uh, that's been my kind of working um, method since the beginning of this. If someone's got a better idea than the one I had, let's talk about it, let's incorporate your ideas into this. You know, I've worked with opposition on the CERB, on the student benefit, on the disability supplement. We've, we've made things better by working together and I see a, a, a way forward that we can do that on this. I have heard that, to be fair, fr from the opposition. They have appreciated in, in my conversations with them uh, sort of the collaborative approach, specifically in your realm uh, mm -hmm. uh, of legislation. So I'm wondering, do you think it's okay that Parliament was shut down? Like, is, are, what's your personal opinion on it? Do you, would you have preferred to be working right now in Parliament? Well, I think I'm absolutely comfortable with resetting the the agenda of the government. It's simply we're not where we were eight months ago. The vision for Canada doesn't even ring true as true anymore. I'm looking forward to, to sharing with Canadians the Prime Minister's vision, what we think as a government we need to do to help get through the economic recovery and any bumps along the road in terms of um, yeah, additional waves or outbreaks of COVID-19. I'm excited that we're going to do a speech from the throne to tell you the truth because I think that all the gaps and all the systems in our government that this this pandemic has laid bare, we can we can start fixing them. Did you need five weeks to do that? I, well, I'm a system fixer, so I think we could use as much time as we absolutely need to put everything in place, figure out, think long-term care, think child care, think the disability piece. We couldn't find a way to deliver to Canadians with disabilities. Think EI and how many people aren't in that system that maybe should be. Um, I could give you five more systems that have shown to have significant gaps through this pandemic, and we've had to work within them to deliver, but it's been frustrating. I want to talk a little bit about those systems, and in particular, uh, the specific benefits that were announced today. Uh, some of the criticisms already flagged to me through the opposition. You mentioned, uh, you know, you were waiting to hear what their what their specific criticisms were. Mm -hmm. uh, the the one benefit that you've created, let's say, for example, for the one million Canadians who are on the SERB but don't qualify for the EI, four hundred dollars a yep. week. That's less than they're getting on the CERB. What's the rationale there? What, is it all about, you know, trying to incentivize a return to work? Yes, it is. In fact, that's exactly the point, that we, we had a benefit level on the CERB um, that was criticized, and we we did the math and we did some modeling and we determined that a, 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 a level of $400 um, was the kind of the most equitable way forward when we look at what people would be getting in EI and of course we've we've committed to raising the minimum uh, weekly amount on EI to 400 as well because it was not fair to give people who'd been contributing to EI less than people who'd not been contributing and be getting this recovery benefit that was a key kind of aspect of the CERB was why we didn't want that inequity um, we figure that 400 is that that middle ground and of course we can talk, uh, we'll all be talking about whether it should have been 500 or some people told us reduce it by half, get people working. We didn't think that was fair. It, it became it became the sweet spot. Is that bowing though somewhat to conservative, conservative ideology that, you know, uh, and not saying the conservative party, but a conservative ideology or, or idea that's being put forth that people who are receiving these types of benefits are choosing to do so instead of trying to look for work? Like, are you just trying to Absolutely please not. your critics? I don't buy into that at all, to tell you the truth. So I've then why never... not make it $500? Well, we've coupled it with an ability to earn basically an unlimited amount of income, right? So what we've done is instead of having the $1,000 threshold, we're putting in place a working while on claim model where Canadians can work and every dollar they earn gives them 50 cents towards the max of, you know, it'll be um, clawed back is, is kind of not a very positive way of saying, but at tax time we'll recover money above a certain threshold. But the idea is people can earn this $400 a week and work, and they could work $1,000 a week. They could work $1,500 a week. So we're trying to listen. People didn't like the $1,000 threshold. We've got a slightly 80% of CERB is $400, but people can earn, um, I wouldn't say unlimited because there's a, high, a upper income, but that's the point, right? But you could have had, let's say, something that equated was was equal to CERB and still incentivize work. Had it so-called clawback, you know, depending on the amount of work that they did. We could have, and we just determined that the the, the best way forward was at four hundred dollars. But you are open to amending that going forward because I, I'm th we I'm have thinking to of be, right. That's that's yeah. I, I'm committed to being open to all of this stuff because that's the way we're going to reach consensus, and that's how we make it better. If you know, that's how we've done it on on. I would say every other thing I've had my hands in in this, in this crisis is by working with people and, and making it better.
I ask just because I, I think of the, the criticism, for example, of the student benefit. Why isn't why wasn't that more? Or the program, the student grant program, why were you paying less than minimum yeah. wage, right? It's a similar vein. Yeah, and, and I will tell you that we've tried to incorporate the criticisms of the $1,000 cliff, the working well on benefit, um, training, we're going to provide access to training for people, all the things that you can get by being an EI, we're trying to make available in slightly different ways because we don't have the system like we do in EI to do this, but the point is to be flexible and incentivize work and help people get back on their feet. Okay, I'll leave it there. I'm out of time. I appreciate your time this evening, Minister Qualtro. My pleasure. Nice speaking with you. You as well. We really believe we owe it to Canadians, we owe it to members of Parliament to be clear about our plan and our strategy. This speech from the throne will lay that out and then all members of Parliament will have a chance to deliver their verdict. Newly minted Finance Minister Christopher Freeland there making the case for the government's extended and expanded pandemic support programs. The CERB will be extended for another month and the federal government is introducing new programs to help people who won't qualify for a transition to EI and some others. But none of the new money can be debated by Parliament until after September 23rd because the government prorogued Parliament on Tuesday. Time for the power panel to weigh in on that. In Toronto, pomp and circumstances, Amanda Alvaro and Andrew Thompson is also in Toronto. Toronto Chief, he's Chief of Government Relations for the University of Toronto and former Saskatchewan Finance Minister. Emily Nicola is a columnist with Le Devoir and co-founder of Quebec Inclusive. She's in Montreal and in Montreal, Quebec. Jason Leader is with Enterprise Canada. Hey guys, great to see you. Hello. Uh, Amanda, I'm going to start with you. So uh, the government announced some, um, I kind of hear an echo of my own voice. I hope, I don't know if you guys are hearing it too. And I apologize to anyone. If it's just in my head, then that's good. But uh, Amanda, uh, the government made some really significant announcements today. I know a lot of Canadians were eagerly anticipating lots of details about the kind of help they can expect in a more, on a more long-term basis. The thing is though, the only way that stuff gets passed other than the shift to EI is if Parliament uh, gets on board with it and the throne speech passes a confidence vote. Uh, the accusation from the opposition is that the Liberals are playing politics with this. What do you think about that? Well, listen, I think that there are, there's a lot of politics being played across the board, but I think when it comes to the financial health of families in Canada, it's where all parties can at least to some extent agree. I think that this has been obviously a really stressful time, but particularly heading into what felt like the end of the deadline on CERB. So people have been waiting to hear what's going to happen with CERB. Will it be extended? It's extended for another four weeks. And more importantly, what will the transition to EI look like? And this is not something that has just been a liberal uh, talking point. This has been the request of the opposition parties. Everybody is eager to understand how this transition will take place. And what happened today was a truly significant change to EI, lowering the requirements, so 120 hours work week required, and really a much more generous payout to families. Uh, and I think the one other thing that, that was making a lot of headlines today was around the caregiver um, benefit. So allowing families who may, particularly mothers, working moms who found themselves having to stay home to a lot of homeschooling, if they find that a daycare or a school is closed, they can access this $500 a week benefit. And that I think is breathing a sigh of relief to a lot of parents who are very concerned about what the next few weeks look like. I agree. There's a lot of parents that are, are worried about that and, and we're, I'm sure would be super interested in that benefit. The thing is, let's take that benefit, for example. That's one of the ones that needs to go through the house, right? Uh, Jason, let me get your take on that because, uh, the, the, like I said, the criticism is, look, this stuff is needed. I'm, I'm not taking away at all from the merit of, of the programs that are announced, but basically those new benefits, ha the, the Liberals will have to, you know, pass with flying colors through the throne speech in order to see them even debated in the House of Commons. Yeah, you're seeing here is, a, you know, the, the sort of cover up we cover up strategy is, is you know, now the rubber hits the road, right? We've got a month. Uh, they aren't going in. Like, what a great time to actually present these things to 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 um, to the, the the Parliament of Canada and debate them you know back in the spring there were a lot of improvements made on the gov on the government's proposed programs to make them richer better work a little bit better for goodness sakes I wish they would have done a little bit better job on their commercial uh, help program which has been a, an absolute disaster they actually need some recommendations from the opposition from others from provinces and they aren't doing that because they want to avoid you know the we committees for the next like what a big price to pay for Canadians that we may not get these programs right and 
uh, you know, because they want to avoid Parliament. The other thing that I'd like to see from them, um, you know, as soon as possible is these programs were designed to help people through a really impossible time. I remember when uh, back in the back in the spring, Mr. Champagne said it's time for Canadians to come home, you know, come home. Well, now it's time for Canadians, if they can, to get a job. If they can't, these programs are absolutely necessary, but we can't afford to float people forever. And they have to send a message to people that it's time to get back to work if you can. Well, well, there. I mean, I asked Minister Qualtra about that and, and that she was pretty explicit that that's why, for example, some of the benefits are less than CERB and that so many of them have built into them now. Uh, you know, in, I don't want, I'm not sure if incentive is the right word, but they, they essentially once you start working, they end up clawing back. So you don't lose them completely by working. Uh, that's that's a perspective they put forward on the idea of Parliament being shut down, Andrew, and and uh, whether or not opposition will have any opportunity to sort of help craft this legislation or amend or whatever ends up being the legislation or amend the programs at all. Uh, Minister Qualter also said that there would be discussions over the next five weeks. Is that enough to substitute for what might take place in Parliament should it have been open? Well, again, let's remember that the uh, both the Liberals and the, and the Tories were not keen to have Parliament sit over the summer. Uh, the Liberals have now, of course, because of the self-inflicted wound that is the uh, uh, ethics scandal around we had to prorogue. Uh, it does, however, uh, have forced their hand. They have extended the CERB for, for a month, which many people have been calling for as the new programs get put into place. There's still a lot of questions around this, though, and I think uh, understanding what the, the transition is, how this uh, temp these temporary benefits are going to work, uh, whether there are longer-term solutions that could be put in place, like uh, changes to the, the Canada Workers' Benefit that might allow uh, for, uh, for provinces and federal government to work more closely together to make sure Canadians are protected, where there are these ups and downs that are coming in the, uh, in the job market. But, you know, on, on balance, I want to say I think that this is generally a, a big step in the right direction. We were told just four months ago by the Prime Minister uh, many of these changes were impossible. There was no way whatsoever the federal government could... Uh, use uh, could implement uh, sick leave. I mean, uh, Jagmeet Singh was uh, supposedly just a fool for suggesting that the Constitution would even permit such a thing. But the dogged work of provinces and of folks like uh, Premier Horgan have really allowed uh, this type of uh, federal uh, measure to come together. And the federal governments and the provinces have actually, I think, worked out a pretty good uh, package of, of benefits here. Now the question will be, what does it look like as it becomes more permanent? Yeah, and, and Emily, I, I kind of want to circle back to the strategy of it all, because like I said, the, the Prime Minister said two days ago, we're going to come back on September 23rd, we're going to have a, a throne speech, and then we're going to, uh, it's going to be a confidence vote on that, right? And, and basically that sets it up that I, I'd imagine that throne speech will, you know, that vote will have to go in the government's favor uh, in order for this kind of stuff to come before Parliament, And I'm wondering what position you think, is that smart strategy? Like, take away the cynicism for a second. Is it smart? Does it put the opposition on their heels? Or do you think it'll backfire? Um, yeah, it's hard to take away the cynicism. Uh, because <laughs> what, you have, what you have is a really, uh, you know, important plan. Uh, it's about helping Canadians through uh, a historical economic crisis. So nobody can be for you know delaying that help and so by the end this this help could have been voted without a confidence vote if they hadn't prorogued the parliament right mm -hmm. and so what they're doing now is tying the help with getting a confidence vote uh from the opposition and so if the opposition was to not do that then the government could blame the opposition for not wanting to help Canadian you know putting partisan politics over the interests of the country I, the, the the partisan lines you know write themselves and by forcing not one but two confidence vote in the fall because it's the speech drone and also uh, eventually also a budget if they um, do a budget if they do a budget then it makes it very hard for the opposition to then also come up with some sort of rationale to call an election, for example, in the spring, if that was their preferred scenario, because they just gave again their confidence to the liberal, the minority liberal government once, maybe twice. And so uh, in terms of tactics, it, it's, it's, it's great, but it's great in a very dark way, <laughs> I would say. Uh, but it does serve... Um, uh, I guess uh, if if people if Canadians were looking for stability in government did not want to have an election in the fall, uh, this scenario creates uh, you know uh, it binds the opposition in a way, but it also because the opposition is 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 binded, it makes it more difficult actually to have an election in the fall. Yeah. That's something that Canadians did not did not want. What do you think of it as a, as a strategy, Amanda? And it's interesting because I've spent the week looking at, for example, the New Brunswick election, where the message is the same from Blaine Higgs there, right? Like if you want stability. 
ability during a really tumultuous time, keep voting for us type of thing. What do you, what do you think of it as a strategy? Yeah, and I think I think to a certain extent, I mean, when you look at the the focus, the almost relentless dogged focus of the conservatives on the we controversy versus the pandemic and the needs of Canadians and EI and CERB and what does that look like? You almost put they almost put the liberals in a box where it's like we have to change the channel, not just because it's not great for us, but also because we have to focus on the things that Canadians actually want us to focus on. And I think by by doing this, they've taken into account the changes that the NDP wanted to see. They've taken into consideration what CBC has called for, which is, you know, more wage subsidy, getting people back to work. But they've said, OK, now we all have to come together on this thing that actually matters instead of the Pierre Polyev, you know, um, silly press conferences where he's throwing papers around that have nothing to do with anyone's life. This is about critical decision making that families are trying to deal with at this juncture in the pandemic. And I think the liberals have sort of played a card really well to say, at the end of the day, we're going to come back and you're going to have to face Canadians and say what was really important. And the Conservatives are going to have to come to the table and either say it's the we controversy or it's the things that actually matter to Canadian families. Jason, I wish we saw Jason's face for a bit of that, but but it was highly entertaining to watch it for the for the first portion. I know he wants to jump in. Uh, does Amanda have a point there? Oh, no, I think he's muted himself. Jason, I don't know if you can hear me, but I think you've muted yourself. I'm sorry there about you that. Go. I was just, I was so exasper exasperated that I had to mute myself. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a fam it's a family show, Vashi. The um, listen, the, the idea that the, that those were silly tactics. Listen, like uh, uh, Amanda says, nobody cared about that. Well, I think Bill Morneau cared about it. He's since lost his job because of the ethical failings of this whole of this whole controversy. And we can do two things at once. By the way, we can actually run a competent government and give people the help they need, and also possibly not break ethics laws. Uh, we can do two things at once. So I, I do. I, I love the sort of liberal spin of we can only do one thing. We can only do this. We can't. You know, they had a really big screw up over the last little bit. It's cost them significantly in terms of t public support. A lot of Canadians are talking about it. I know the liberals don't want to don't want to hear that, but a lot of Canadians are talking about it. We haven't seen the prime minister other than a couple of news conferences to, to announce a quick change in weeks. This has really hurt them, and they are trying to change the channel. I think it is smart tactics, by the way, to put to force a confidence vote on the throne speech. I think that's smart politics, but it's not helping Canadians. Let's be honest. If they wanted to really help Canadians, they would have rolled out this measure this week. They would have got a vote for it to, to roll it ahead. If it was so darned important, why didn't they do it this week rather than wait a month? Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.